don't think I can turn the volume off on YouTube until we start. That's okay. We're live. <laughs> what uh, is going on, right. guys? We're already live, so it's all good. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday night live oh. stream. I know. What's going on, Adam? Hold on. I'm tripping out here because I'm hearing <laughs> two things. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. What's up, dude? <laughs> What's happening, man? Welcome to the Wednesday night live uh, stream. you know. Yeah, it's been a little while, I think, since we've done it, so it uh, should be fun. You're, you're far overdue. Uh, yes. Th Thursday, my Monday. Dedicated refresh, a whole different schedule on there, buddy. Um, is that Adam I hear? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. The one and only. Um, hello, Salty <laughs> Fan. What's going on, Shelly? Today, we're talking about building a, a bulletproof reef tank and having a long-term successful tank. And, you know, a lot of tanks, you know, the first year is a bit of a challenge. The first couple of years, you know, usually most people are successful. But over time, long enough, there's a lot of stuff that can happen and potentially nuke your tank. So today we're talking about that kind of long-term successful pro tips. What's going on, AK Reef? one arm mm, Reefer? Yeah. Nick? So, and so also, that, I mean, I would say there's some some foundational things people should know from setting up a, a, their first tank, too, that is pretty critical to having mm -hmm. long term success. So, I mean, I got a lot of notes here. I don't know if we'll get to all of it. Ah, I, good, I mean, I got I got lots of time. <laughs> I have faith in us. We're good. I would just like to compliment yeah. you that the fact that I realize that you have matching headphones and a matching mic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Well, you know, going to copy the best, right? <laughs> <laughs> meant to be, buddy. Meant to be. AK Reefer. Hit that like button. Appreciate it, guys. If you enjoyed this, as always, hit that like button. Make the YouTube gods happy. So, starting with the reef tank, what, in your opinion, is the most common reason a tank will crash or fail or something will happen? Yeah, I would probably say heaters is going to be one of the number one things. Yep. Um, and probably one of my, I have a couple top pet peeves when it comes to, um, you know, dangers for a reef aquarium. But I'm really not a fan of glass heaters. Hmm. Um, Interesting. And I mean, if you think about a glass heater, it's glass, so it can break easily. Yeah. Uh, usually, I mean, glass will also crack if it's out of the water and then it gets exposed back to water quickly because of the temperature difference. Uh, a lot of glass heaters have, have a built-in thermometer, which is not always 100% reliable either. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a big advocator for titanium heaters. Um, I, I don't know. What are you using on your systems? Do you have any glass heaters? I have a Nano with the glass <laughs> heater with the good old Eheim mm -hmm. Jaggers. Jaeger, Jaeger. Um, yeah. not, not Jaegermeister, uh, Jaeger. There is both my big reef tanks, so I did go with titanium heaters on them. Yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, something I would also say is, like, if you're going to use any kind of heater, uh, you definitely want to have more than one probe that is controlling it. I think just mm -hmm. relying on the one probe is is not safe if you're just running a nano and if it's not you know your reef is just kind of a little fun little thing on the side like you don't need to get too obsessed with um you know having redundancy for that but to me like i think um you know even if you're just using your apex to control your heater um add a second apex probe in a slightly different location in the tank um that will alert you if there's a, a temperature no very very wise uh, now it's interesting I've, I've never really personally used the apex to control it per se. I kind of let the heater do its thing and then use the apex as a backup. Now, I'm also the big fan of using a heater controller. I mean, that being said, I do not have one on my Nano, but I do have one on both of my big tanks. And those ones, I have a heater controller plugged into the apex with the aquarium controller so that the aquarium controller does all the heavy lifting and the apex is just there as like an extra backup. Now, the front line. Oh, a little bit choppy on me. Dun, dun, dun. You'll be back. Um, so the other big thing that I always do too is, again, in my Nano, again, I'm not doing this, but my bigger tanks, I always use two smaller heaters as well. And for that one too, if you know one of them ever gets stuck on, it's not enough juice to cook your tank. And if one of them fails, then it's usually the other one can still kind of keep it afloat. So I'm always like a, a big fan of that methodology. Still, uh oh, you're still frozen on me. Dun, dun, dun. Um, Great shot. I know, right? It's perfect time to freeze. Dedicated reefer. I place my heater every six months, no exceptions. I don't do that, actually. I've mm. never done, yeah. like, 
the frequent replacing. <laughs> You're still still Tired. nice and choppy. Slightly robotic. Dun, dun, dun. Um, I have an Inkbird controller, two probes, and two heaters. I do that on one tank. So one tank, I do have the an Inkbird. Actually, no, I lied. I, I used to have an Inkbird. I still have it kicking around. But I think I went with like the the Ranko or whatever ones on one. And I have the BRS, which I think is basically just the Inkbird on the other tank. Um, using yeah, like you were saying, you have. Adam, I'm going to call you back, buddy, because you are super choppy right now. We'll see if that fixes it. Just for good measure. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, using Inkbird and Hydros. Yeah, I do think it is a really good idea to use an aquarium controller with a heater controller. Because if one of them does bugger up, then you definitely have that backup. And I think that goes a long way. Dun, dun, dun. See if we can get Adam back in here. Um, I use two undersized heaters on the Inkbird. 100%. I do agree with that one. Um, and yeah, same thing. If not online. Uh oh. Dun, dun, dun. Let's try one more time. He'll be back. Dun. It's almost like the suspenseful Skype beep. 1K inline heater on my systems. Use Apex as a backup. Yeah, I do agree. It is definitely worth using the controller as a backup, mainly because of the wear and tear on the port. If you think about the wear and tear you have on the relay, have it constantly being flicked on and off, that is going to... I'm just going to turn down the Skype a bit. Um, Jagger, pronounced by Jaeger. Ye Jaeger. Dun, dun, dun. All right, call me back when you're online. Dun, dun, dun. We got just the under, underwater world now. Um, two ink birds. So two ink birds on the same tank or different tanks? I can't answer. Hmm. Try calling me. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, running two heaters. Yeah. Dual heaters, 100% way to go. I don't know if I'd bother on a nano, but a larger tank, the dual heaters is definitely, definitely advised for all the bigger systems. Adam, welcome back. Okay, am I back? You're you back. Hear you hear You're, me. I, I can't see you, but I can hear you. We're halfway there. Okay. Uh, yeah, weird. Uh, well, let's see if my video settings are happy over here. They should be. Okay, well, it'll probably come back soon. Um, <laughs> either way, there's that little tiny photo of me. You can just perfect, perfect. What I'm doing uh, right now. <laughs> Excellent. D just turn your camera off on not, and again, that usually fixes it. Yeah. Okay. We could do that. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, so yeah, I think where do we leave off? We were talking about heaters and redundancy. Yep. And I am a strong believer in having two heaters, obviously for redundancy, but also like it, like you say, if one sticks on, then the other one. If one sticks on by accident, it's not going to heat the crap out of your tank. Whereas if yeah. you're running like a 500 watt heater or an eight, they make 800 watt heaters, which also sketches me out because of the power draw. That is a lot of one outlet, especially if you're running yeah. a lot of other stuff. Yeah, so sure. here's a question for you. Um, so generally, I okay, can't. Titanium heater obviously doesn't have the element on most of them. But if you were to use a heater with a built in element, would you let that be the primary or would you let the heater controller be the primary and use the built in thermostat as a backup? Any preference? Uh, sorry, I, my, I'm on my wrong. I'm having issues here still. The camera is not working now. Hmm, it's all good. We'll get it. We'll just look at your um, tiny, lovely, smiling face. Yeah, I mean, what I usually do is, say, if I'm controlling a heater with the Apex, is I actually set the set point. So if it is a uh, heater with a built-in thermometer in it, I'll set it mm -hmm. slightly higher than the amount that I want, and then I'll have the Apex control or whatever else is controlling it so that it won't not turn on, you know what okay. I mean? Like yeah. set it like a degree or a half a degree higher. Kind of okay. Thing. Awesome. Yeah. That That's kind of my outlook too. That way, for whatever reason, if it ever gets stuck on, or I mean, sorry, if the heater control ever failed, that at least the built in one would never be used. And in theory, that little piece of metal that works for the thermostat would still do its job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, they're usually fairly cheap little mechanisms. So, um, I don't know. If you're going to invest in anything and you want to do it properly, I would say, um, you know, buy a quality heater, buy titanium, have redundancy for probes, make sure those probes are seated well, make sure they're 
you know, in a place in your sump that say is always going to be in the water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing you can do too is if you have a controller that can take multiple temperature probes, is put one in the tank and one in the sump. So if you have a return pump fail for some reason, you're not just getting a reading from the bottom, you're getting it from both, hmm. both parts of the tank. Yeah, that's actually a, a good way to do it. I have two probes now, but one's just like room temperature, one's the tank temperature. I should do or do yeah. a second one in this sump or at least a different half of the sump or chamber. Yeah, yeah, it's not much to spend considering like the repercussions if you have a have a melt meltdown or something. So, no, very very um, true. All right, so so something else I will say is about the power draw of heaters is um, like Apex outlets are only rated, I think, for uh five amp or 10 amp so you know you need to make sure that you have a heater that's appropriate for that outlet because you can overload it pretty easily very true um, so that's another reason to split it split your wattage over multiple heaters on the similar note i guess this would really depend on your system size but another strategy for hey, some back. hey welcome back <laughs> all right your picture's moving again we're getting fancy uh <laughs> With having multiple circuits to your tank, I know with my tank, I kind of stole some off another circuit, but I still have two separate circuits. So I'm like splitting the load over two different circuits. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that can also help too. So one strategy could Definitely. be if yeah. you have, yeah. So if you have that option, you know, potentially if you have two half heaters, you can put one on each circuit and then, you know, for instance, a breaker or something pops, you know, you'd still have heat. You wouldn't completely lose it. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yep. definitely split it up, distribute it. Um, yeah, and obviously the newer uh, Apex, the EB32, well, it's been out for quite a while now, but it actually gives you a breakdown of what the draw is on each outlet, which is super yep. cool. So That's um, actually one of my favorite features of it. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's also kind of depressing because you realize how much electricity you're using. <laughs> oh, do you know what your tanks take? Just like side rant. Mm. I haven't looked at it in a while, and I'm also using a couple of the older bars, um, yeah. which just give you the total, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't want to know, to be honest. <laughs> that's fair. I, I worked it out. I'm like, yeah, that's a good chunk. And I put solar on my house. I'm like, oh, at least it cancels out the, the tanks a little bit. <laughs> Case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so next one I would move to, and one of my second biggest pet peeves is, uh, let's talk about salinity a little bit mm, and salinity mishaps. Uh, so I think something that people really need to not try to rely on is salinity electrodes. Like, I think they're great for like monitoring your salinity, like on a regular basis. And if you see yeah. trends going in different directions, but I don't really think that there's a product out there that is really, really super duper reliable. That's fair. So I would definitely, I think everybody should own a refractometer, um, yeah. and you know, Test your salinity again. Like, say you get some coral or fish from a local shop or something. Test your salinity against that salinity. Just as a like, yeah. oh, let's just see if we're like within a similar range. And you know that would get to uh, acclimatizing corals too, which I don't really believe you really have to acclimatize corals. But if the salinity is wildly different, mm -hmm. it's definitely worth worth looking into that. I think if it's off, um, you know, if if if, the, if it's coming from water that's like 1.02 two and your water is 1.027 um mm. i would probably do a drip on corals otherwise i just put corals right in generally but now is there just my rule of thumb is there any difference for the type of coral like an acro versus an lps versus like what about something like say an anemone that's like full of water if it's a different salinity like do you think that plays into the issue of it all yeah i mean i don't know enough about about it um like, like the more i'm hearing these days is like corals are very good at self acclimating mm -hmm. uh but i think that there's a i definitely have seen people let salinity drift and uh, uh say i've shipped them corals and they put them in and they've been like this stuff is not doing very well and the first thing i ask them to do is to check their salinity mm -hmm. uh, and then they're like oh my salinity is 1.032 and i didn't even yeah. notice like i just calibrated my refractometer so um, the other thing too is uh use a proper uh calibration solution for your refractometer don't use ro it's just not it's not because it's such a far off from the actual range you're looking at i have some <laughs> uh, on my desk you want to have yeah. that proper yeah yeah for sure so 
Hey, it mm. looks like my video is properly back now. That's good. Yeah, you're back. You're a little bit choppy for a bit. Yeah. Is your computer on Wi-Fi yeah. or wired? It's on Wi-Fi, but I got a booster like right there. So I just reset it. So it should be good now. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So do okay so do you prefer so i have just out of curiosity i have like the barber style ones i have refractometers i have the digital ones i kind of use the digital the most but then i will use the refractometer yeah. like double check it sometimes if i think it's off over time but what, what do you use as your go-to yeah i use a refractometer because i mean it's measuring gravity basically so it's like you know this little plate that's sitting between a drop of water and a way to view it and mm -hmm. gravity <laughs> is one of those things that is very consistent. Fair point. You know, gravity is not going to fail you. If gravity fails you, then we're having a much bigger problem than <laughs> our reef tanks. Fair point. Fair point. Okay. No, that's fair enough. So, yeah. so refractometers your go-to. Do you calibrate it every time you use it or just like periodically? Uh, I recalibrate it about once a month. And the other thing mm -hmm. I do is if I'm ever uh, bringing in any corals or fish or whatever, I, I check against that. And if I, if I see that something is like different from a few points off, I'll, I'll do a check on mine and just be like, is it me or is it that, you know? So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely worth paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and also like if you know somebody that's getting into the hobby for the first time and if they don't understand salinity and evaporation, that can be a total disaster for new hobbyists. So just make sure if you know a new person getting into the hobby that mm -hmm. you explain that fresh water evaporates, salt water stays the same, <laughs> or it gets saturated in salinity. So you need sure they understand that. I, ex uh, I explain that more than so, you, you know, would think. For, first principles. <laughs> Yeah, I 100% I yeah, so. explained that at least once this week to somebody. They're like, first tank, you know, do I got to top off salt water? I'm like, yeah. nope, nope, nope. Salt doesn't evaporate, just the water does. You got to use your purified water. Yeah. Um, totally. Port rules. Um, another thing I would say just mm -hmm. to keep in mind is if you're dosing two-part, your salinity will rise very slowly. So... Uh, you know, there's, there's reasons to check on a regular basis too, but, uh, obviously that's a thing that probes are good for. Like the apex yeah. salinity probe, if you're running an apex is good for mm -hmm. just like showing a trend, but, but yeah. just don't, don't think that that's the only thing you can rely on. No, it's true. You do want to double check it once in a while because yeah. it can drift. I mean, if there's high voltage wire beside it, it can mess with it. If there's air bubbles on it, it can mess with it. So there's a lot of different variables. Yeah. And another thing to note, if your totally, salinity totally. is off, everything is off. Because your salinity like raises the bar of stuff. So if your salinity is elevated or low, that could be messing with the rest of your parameters as well. So it is important. And people forget about yeah. it once, you know, yeah, they're a year totally. or two in, they forget about it and it could be causing issues. Yeah, yeah. It's that getting too complacent too. Just uh, you know. Yep. Stay on top of it. Oh, and another thing, just a final note on that, is if you do notice that your salinity has drifted in a certain direction. Mm-hmm. Adjust it very, very slowly back to where you want it. Just do it even slower than you think you need to do it. Because it's it's that can mess with your tank for sure. Agreed. One so, if it's yeah. been low. Uh, okay, what's what's the next uh Oh, one one, one one quick little pro tip. If your salinity is really low and you want to bump it back up, putting salt water in your ATO can be a nice gentle way to do it, kind of in an automated fashion until it gets back up to normal. Um if it's too high, I mean really yeah. you just gotta do a bit of a water change and add more RO. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, totally. Uh, okay, so let's talk about ATO, auto top off. Yep. Uh, and just in general, um, you know, topping off your fresh water. Uh, so one thing that I've found is a lot of the ATO kits on the market, um, I think the Tunesy one's kind of one of the better ones out there, but um, mm -hmm. the feed pumps tend to have issues. Um, hmm. So like, what do you use? What are your, what's your go-to for for topping off i have a tunes on one tank and i have the neptune one on the other tank so th those are the two that i'm currently using and then the nano does yeah. not yet have one <laughs> it has this cup yeah. of water that i yeah and i mean randomly. <laughs> one thing that's you know definitely presenting disasters is uh the size of your reservoir like you have to mm -hmm. think about the size of that reservoir and if worst case scenario that entire thing ended up in your tank when it was completely full um, you know, you have to think about the repercussions of that. I think that, say, 
a five gallon reservoir on a 100 gallon tank, if all of that went into the tank in, you know, several hours, you would probably be okay. You know, the trade off is that you have to top off that reservoir more often. Yeah. Have you, you know. ever had that happen? Uh, no, I haven't actually. And one of the reasons for that, uh, which is a little point is if you add a float switch, if you have the means to add a float switch in addition to the, uh, the electrodes or sensors or whatever, uh, come in those ATO kits, then you have mm -hmm. this like mechanical, uh, like extra stage to it. So I know the yeah. Neptune one has a built in float switch. So that's, that's a, you know, good, good one for that. But those optical sensors are, uh, they can be a little finicky from my understanding. I feel like some of these ATO units are more likely to not run than they are to run when they're not supposed to. I would agree. Um, I've had it where my yeah. Tunzi one example hasn't kicked on. It's usually because there's like some scum and some stuff built up on the optical sensor. So you take a little toothbrush, you have a quick scrub, and then it's back to happy yeah. working again for a few more months. But absolutely can be a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fun, fun little side story. One of my buddies had, I think it was like a 30 or 50 gallon brute container for a, full of auto top off water that he set for going on vacation for like a week or two. So they didn't have to worry about it. However, yeah. he did not consider the, he did not add a siphon break. So, uh, buddy, other buddy yeah. came over to check on his tank and the sump literally was like a millimeter from the top of overflowing. Like he <laughs> unloaded half of yeah. that brute trash can wow. or whatever it was into the sump and it literally leveled out just like he was like yeah within like i'm gonna say five ten mils of it overflowing all over his floor um thankfully his tank everything yeah. is fine but having a siphon break in it is yeah. important especially if it's elevated above your sub level yeah and that's actually something i have in my notes is uh this is its own little category here but um going away on vacation being away from your tank i think that there's something to be said for if you're going to go away and you want to change something or have something prepared for while you're on your vacation, make sure that it's running properly for like a couple weeks before you leave. Don't do it like two or three days or the day that you leave and just be like, oh, well, now we have a bigger RO reservoir, you know, mm -hmm. like because that's the time when the entire thing's going to empty into your tank because <laughs> you've missed something. And yep. we're all stressed out before we leave for a trip. Let's face it. <laughs> that's <laughs> you know? fair. Yeah. So. There's always a yeah. bunch of last minute stuff. Um, there was a comment, uh, the which I'm gonna call it the Tunesy one's a bit noisy. The pump, um, it can be. What I did with mine, I floated yeah. it, so I made sure it was like just suspended a little bit above the bottom, so it's not touching anything and it gets rid of a lot of the vibration noise. And I did see they did come out with a new pump, which I'm, is on my to future to buy list to hopefully make it even quieter and better. But yeah, Perfect. yeah, and uh, back to the uh, refractometer thing, gravity is very very consistent and stable so if you have a top off with the say a float switch uh you can just use a reservoir that is elevated above the sump level and it will just drain down and you don't have to worry about using a feed pump so uh, um yeah i hate feed pumps uh to be honest okay so another sort of method is using something that's direct hooked up to your ro unit and i don't recommend mm -hmm. this for everybody but I will say that this is what I do because I have three separate systems yep. and I have, uh, I have a quarter inch tubing that pressurizes into every system. And mm -hmm. the last system to fill is the one that requires the most water. Uh, I have multiple redundancies. So I have two solenoids on the way in. Uh, I have float switches on all the tanks and I have sensors on one of the other tanks if the level gets above a certain amount. So that would be the last one to turn off the... Oh, and then the other thing is it only runs twice a day for, I think, an hour and a half. So, um, But I, I wouldn't recommend for the newbie hobbyist to be messing around with direct plumbing into an RO, RO unit. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, like gravity, water pressure is also very, very consistent and reliable. So, <laughs> you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. Also true. Now... I have a hybrid approach to that where I still have an ATO container, but it auto refills itself. Um, so it's still that endless water supply. Mm -hmm. It saves yeah. me the effort. But what I did on one system is I have the little marriage saver thing, which has an optical sensor and a solenoid valve. So that when it has power, it turns on. When it hits the optical sensor, it turns off. So I have that hooked up from my between my RO mm -hmm. and my five gallon reservoir. 
and I have it automated. So whenever, you know, my optical sensor on the Neptune is low, it gives power to that outlet. It lets it refill up and it never actually hits its own optical sensor because I have a level sensor and I have it turn off a little bit below it. But if it ever did overflow, yeah. it would hit that other optical sensor, completely separate system, as well as there's also a flow valve on there. So it's all these little like levels of extra safety, yeah. which is important if you are going to automate using an endless water supply. Like it's relatively safe, but you just yeah. want to make sure you have those extra safety levels. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I yeah. agree with you. Um, yeah, so I think that kind of covers the auto top off side of things. Uh, I mean, I think this is one that kind of goes without saying, uh, let's see here, uh, probe and wire management. We can talk about that a little bit. I think, uh, you know, I, I definitely need to practice what I preach here too, because I definitely have a couple of rats nests right now, but, um, <laughs> you and me both, man. I mean, it. yeah. Make sure that you have your power supplies off the floor. If if you if that's the only thing you're going to spend some time just getting together is make sure those power supplies are off the floor. Power yeah. bars are off the floor. Just it's not hard to get things elevated. Um, you know, if you can get it a little bit better in your wire management, like use some um, uh, uh, some Velcro straps for things. You know, get the wires nice and like loop them up, tidy them up. Yep. Uh, you know. Because you don't want to have to pull on something and then potentially, you know, you're pulling on a on a on a cable that's connected to say one of your pumps, and uh, you know it pulls out one of your heater probes out of your sump or something like that because mm -hmm. it's just not, you know, it's it's not isolated well enough and there's a yeah. there's a rat's nest down there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not winning any prizes for the tidiest uh, wiring, but uh, like I feel like I've been able to avoid. Uh, uh, you know, any water getting on any electronics, yeah. at least for a few years. So, <laughs> so again, that that's why you want to elevate it. So if there ever is a leak, you're, you're, it's not seeping into your power bars, your bricks and all that type of stuff. So on the side, A, keeps it neater. B, keeps it further away yeah. from ever getting wet and, you know, shorting out and causing issues. Now, yeah. Yeah. most of us... Um, and that Oh, go ahead. As I was gonna say, most of us start out with a super nice wire management. Well, some of us, and then, but over time, usually as you change stuff, it gets kind of a rat's nest yeah. again. So I mean, it is you know periodically, it's good to give it a little bit of an overhaul. And Velcro tape really is your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, if you have a, a, like a hobbyist friend that um, you know is 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 kind of into doing that stuff like you know we all have a friend like that that's probably going to do a better job than you so um i got a couple buddies that help me out sometimes with organization which is nice so i don't like doing work on my knees i'm too tall for that yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm with you okay uh, comment in the chat red devil number one thing get a quality tank last thing you want is to come home to your tank busted all over the floor yesterday Somebody yeah. I know texted me a photo of their tank that split a seam and everything during. I was like, "Oh, that would be the worst thing ever to actually go through." So yeah, um, something yeah, I don't and consider, one thing um, important. I do have a note on this is, um, I do have a note on this, and it's um, if you, I think most newer tanks, like the the build and the manufacturing and the silicone work is is well done. But if you're using a secondhand tank. You really want to know like the history of that tank and the what the age of the silicone. How if mm -hmm. the silicone has spent much time uh, not wet, like with with yep. no water contact, it's going to dry out and it's going to be way more prone to uh, busting out on you. Yep. So um, beware used tanks and how long they've been dry for and and how old they are. I think that's a that's a big one for sure. Hundred percent agree. If a tank was wet, I would be way more confident with it way longer. But if it sat and dried out again, you know the if the silicone dries out it's not as strong it's not as solid of a bond so i guess that's yeah. a question i did see that in the chat earlier today and it was around how long would you trust a tank you know after 10 years are you going to trust your tank would you want a new tank would you be happy with your silicone does it depend if you see bubbles or it's starting to lift like what do you think for a long-term silicone yeah i had a tank that was probably I'm trying to think here uh, probably like 12 years old, but it had had water in it pretty mm -hmm. much the whole time. And I didn't have any concerns about it. Yep. Um, yeah, I honestly think it's just, it just comes down to if it, if a tank is sat dry for a certain period of time. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah I don't know. I couldn't tell you, uh, what, what the, the turning point is. I would agree. 
I've seen yeah. some tanks before where they had like braces across the tank holding and all this kind of stuff. Um, I've, I had a glass tank crack once, but that was from the curved glass and I guess the stress on it. I've never actually had a seam yeah. be an issue personally, but, um, did you do? Yeah. yeah, me neither, but, uh, knocking on wood. Very, very <laughs> true. Uh, so let's talk about return pumps for a second, because this is another thing I think, uh, you really want to re think about redundancy when it comes to return pumps. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if you have a tank that can support it, and if you have a lot invested in your, you know, your corals and your fish and your your system, um, just don't rely on one turn pump. If it's a little nano or something, that's fine. Like, yeah. you know, but um, like for one, you're going to get better flow. You might even be able to like say turn the pumps down slightly if they're DC pumps and you're not going to burn them. Well, it's not like they burn out super fast with them, so they're not running at 100% all the time. Um, and then the other thing is, like, I think with return pumps, like, you really want to make a schedule and have reminders uh, to clean them on a regular basis. I think you just did a video on, or maybe I, I saw a video on you cleaning yep. return pumps. <laughs> yeah. I did. It was yeah. motivation for yeah. myself to do it by doing kind of a bit of a how-to video on it. Because I'm like, I haven't not done this in probably close to a year. So I was too. I still got to do the tank beside me, but I did the main yeah. one. Yeah. Now, I do agree. Yeah. If you do no, definitely. a custom tank... And you have the ability to do dual return pumps. That's a sweet way to go. Because, um, again, it gives you redundancy, right? If you have a pump die, water's still going to be flowing through your system because the odds of them both dying is not as high. And then second best yeah. would be if you only have one return pump, if you're able to have a spare of the same pump on hand, makes for a really easy quick swap. If you ever do have an issue with one or you're cleaning it, you can just swap out your pumps, which is another really cool way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if, uh, say, like the Red Sea or the water box tanks, uh, because they're, well, at least the Red Seas are pre-plumbed. Um, I don't know if they give you the option for that easily. Uh, but if you don't have the option to add a second return pump, uh, something I would recommend is like the, the, uh, the Neptune, the Apex, the, or the Neptune core pumps, mm -hmm. uh, because they communicate with your Apex and they can send you a warning if they aren't running. So, uh, are there other pumps on the market that, that are Wi-Fi based that will give you I believe CJ. I believe CJ does. Um, I think I'm pretty sure the Ecotech C pumps do CJ. I always call it Sice, even though I know it's CJ. I actually said it proper today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's habit, habit. I've done this for so many years. Um, so CJ, yeah. I believe it does. I believe the Ecotech pumps do. I believe the core pumps do. Those are the only ones I know for sure. Now, if you have yeah. a well, controller. Well, the Ecotech ones are, the Ecotech ones are Bluetooth, but isn't Ecotech moving into a format where we can Wi-Fi stuff? Potentially. There was some beta testing of it. I don't know what the feature that yeah. has. If it is linked up with the WXM mm -hmm. module, then again, I could talk to the Apex. However, mm -hmm. if you have controller like the newer EV832s with power monitoring, you could also set up an alert for yourself if it drops out of whatever its regular power range are. So even if you're using a pump that doesn't have those features, you might be able to use power monitoring to enable you or give you alerts if your pump's starting to fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, not pretty pretty much covers the return pumps also just get a good so. one yeah that's true <laughs> you know spend a little extra money on the return pump it's like the it's the heart it's the you know yeah it's the blood flow of your system so what do you use? don't cheap out on it what's yours what's your choice uh i use cores and uh vectras nice um i mean i would use a biz if i you know they were money was no price. object i would use biz but <laughs> that's fair <laughs> yeah um yeah no yep, nice okay uh, do, do, do. Uh, so another thing, this is just a quick little little thing, but uh, uh, magnets. Um, hmm. I could think, one. you know, something to consider with magnets is uh, if you, because I hear about a lot of, this is a thing that will cause issues with the tank pretty often. Um, uh, like check your magnet magnets often, but also like if you don't need to have a magnet in the tank, like choose a probe holder that is just acrylic as opposed to the one that has the little you know, magnet in it because it's probably going to be uh, more reliable too because it's going to sit along the edge of the sump or whatever as opposed to like relying on this magnet that's, you know, trying to make a connection between the glass, um, you know. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of just like as, as few magnets as you can have. If you don't need them, then just keep them out of the tank. 
because eventually those the barriers can break down and leach some badass metals into the tank. So check your magnets every periodically. Um, that is a good one. Um, I've had frag racks again where the acrylic yeah. or whatever is broken down, whatever they use for epoxy, and you know they can start to leach or you know some of the little nori feeders. I've definitely had those start to rust over time. So and it can cause issues. So that's a good one. Good yeah. point. Uh, and one more little thing I will add to that is if you are cleaning your, uh, your say your pumps or your impellers or, or whatever, so your MP40s, uh, anything that has a magnet in it, if you use citric acid instead of vinegar, apparently it is a lot better on the magnet's uh, longevity. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more information coming about, out about it, but apparently we want to stay away from vinegar and move towards citric acid as our main uh, cleaning aid for, yeah. you know, breaking down salt gunk That's and fair. Uh, precipitation on the, yeah. Vinegar used to be my go-to, but I, the last couple of years, I've definitely swapped to citric acid, mainly because it's like a jug of vinegar takes a lot of space. We can have a tub of citric acid. That'll yeah. be equivalent to like, you know, 20, yeah. 30 jugs of vinegar. So it's just more space efficient to keep it. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. It's nice and effective for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, let's talk about dosing a little bit and, you know, safety of dosing. Yep. Uh, this would kind of tie into controllers a little bit too. Um, so here's a pet peeve. Uh, the recommended dose of, of what products tell you is, is what you should use. It's always mm -hmm. crazy high. Unless you are running like a heavily stocked reef, like... I remember a customer that was messaging me and he was like, yeah, my elk is like super high. I don't know why. And I just like start asking him some questions. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, you know, I'm dosing the Red Sea, whatever their main, um, you know, balling components are. And I'm like, well, how much of it are you dosing? And he's like, oh, I'm just doing the recommended dose. And I'm like, well, maybe that's way more than your tank needs. <laughs> so, you know, his alkalinity is like 11 or 12. And he's like, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like yeah you know so so be careful with that i mean okay yeah. yes you, you can there is no recommended dose per gallon because it doesn't matter if your tank is freaking one gallon or a thousand gallons if you it depends your coral how much coral you have in there right you can have one tiny little acro in your yeah. tank and it takes next to nothing but you got the same acro in you know a hundred gallon tank and again i mean you have more water volume to pull from so it'll be a bit slower but whatever you're replacing, it, the same coral is going to be yeah. sucking out the same amount of elements out of the water. So yeah, yeah, dosing per gallon you have to test. That's the only way you're going to know 100. percent Yeah, and I mean I think um, some products probably say uh, low stock system dose as much, medium system, you know, heavy stock yeah. system. I think that's probably a good uh, uh, base point for like companies to to go mm -hmm. on because. Yeah, they don't know what the hell your tank is. They don't. They don't know. They don't know me. They don't know me. They don't know <laughs> how know? much coal so, I hoard. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is that some products um, lack transparency in what's in them or what is really obvious about what they are. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to call out Zeovid on this one. Um, <laughs> so be careful if. So say you're doing like a trace element program, like moonshiners or uh, triton or whatever and you're kind of trying to stay on top of your trace elements but then you're dosing i don't know this blue bottle from zeovit that says that it it helps you know enhance color in coral yep a, a lot of the time like a lot of the things that are in that are just going to be things like potassium iodine um you know so if your levels are already sufficient or say even elevated in those areas um you might be pushing them past uh natural seawater levels that could be issues for sure. So I would, I would be careful with that. The other consideration as well is you might be dosing thing If you're dosing trace elements separately and you're dosing like coral booster or whatever, like, you know, one of the blue bottles that has probably those elements in it, you're potentially overdosing it, right? Especially if you're not testing for it because mm -hmm. you, you're dosing yeah, exactly. the unknown concoction, but you're also dosing trace elements on the side. So that, that is a consideration too, yeah. right? If you don't know what's in the, the magic little bottle. That being said, I know you use some of those yeah, magic definitely. blue bottles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah using and I, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm taking a break from the flatworm stop, actually, because uh, my iodine has been high on the last um, few ICPs, and it kind of points to 
the flatworm stop potentially. Um, there's yeah. a discussion going on in Moonshiners uh, right now about that, but uh, mm. yeah, I mean, uh, I, sometimes it's nice to, if you've been using a product for a while to like take a little step back and go like, okay, well, let's just kind of either go light on this or cut back on it completely for a while and see if anything changes because it's not like it's going to be like immediate it's it's you know a supplement like that is just like an addition to everything else that's going on it's not your it's not like a major element or anything so um, i agree yeah but uh yeah and then the other thing is um be careful with um like nitrate and phosphate additives sometimes mm -hmm. are potassium nitrate or potassium phosphate so uh you got to be careful i mean it would be nice if there was some transparency in that too because if it says okay so uh one mil of this product will raise your nitrate by let's say 0.1 or whatever but mm -hmm. it should also say but it will also raise your potassium by 0 0.002 well you know just give us a number yeah. like give us something because like i i still want to know what i'm what i'm adding um, mm -hmm. whether you pay attention to it or not, it's just like make the information available for people that, um, you know, can utilize it. I agree. I agree. Knowing what all, every effect that's knowing that's going to happen on your tank goes a long way. And if you don't know, I mean, if it says dose, you know, 10 mils, maybe dose five It's always safer to dose less. Right. Um, until you know how your tank's going to react to, you know, said brand new product you're playing with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, so something, I don't know if you do this, but um, there are some controllers that are like smart adaptive to say, uh, you can set your apex to use the Trident to take that information to change how much of a product it doses. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. it can control your alkalinity based on the information that's coming in from the apex. And I, I think like, Personally, I wouldn't 100% trust that. I think that's that's great in theory, mm -hmm. um, but unless you're uh, double checking the numbers on your Trident on a regular basis and everything is really well maintained, um, I would be a little bit wary to um, take the human element out of that. So, I actually had Paul from Neptune on a couple weeks ago, and we chatted about this exact topic. Um, yeah. What what yeah. are the okay big things there is you could set the percentage. So there's a maximum allowable range. Let's say you said it's a 30%. It will only dose 30%, a maximum 30% more outside of your set range. So there is that as a safety yeah. feature. Um, so I actually am doing the try and control dosing on my water box, but, but this is dosing my hundred mils a day on top of my calcium reactor on top of my calc. So I let it kind of tweak things. Mm -hmm. Now I am yeah. also doing it with the Alcatronic. But again, that was something that I, I waited like a year or two before I finally gave in and said, okay, I'll try it. Um, and it's been solid. So it's been good for me. But yeah. again, you need to periodically make sure your testers are calibrated, make sure you do the maintenance and all these things if you are relying on it. Like there are safety features built in to make sure it doesn't go out of a certain range. However, you still need to make sure you do your maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, I mean, I definitely test my alkalinity about twice a week with the Salifert kit mm -hmm. um, against my Trident just to make sure it hasn't drifted. I'm less concerned with the calcium and magnesium. Um, I more just watch the trends with them, but but they can start to drift too. So um, mm -hmm. it definitely don't make, make your only testing tool be your auto tester because um, it's just a machine, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think hobby grade kits are better than they sometimes are given credit for. Like, I think, um, you know, I trust them. I trust self for, for sure. Yeah. And this is not for the average person, but if you're ridiculous like me and you have two auto testers, you can use them to keep each other honest. But yes, it, it's definitely yeah. wise <laughs> to do a manual test, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, like yourself twice a week, because you, you obviously grow a lot of coral, but you know, even if it's once a month or once a week, like it's good to do those periodic spot yeah. checks. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing I will talk about with dosing is if you're dosing trace elements and you're kind of getting more into those like nuances, that extra kind of uh, mojo <laughs> stuff. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, I mean, I think people need to be really aware of their actual water volume um, because it is actually hard to calculate your water volume. Um, Agreed. When, okay, sure, you know the water vol volume of your tank and your sump. Uh, 
if they're completely full, but consider and empty. <laughs> okay, your overflow brings it down five, ten percent. Your sump's probably, you know, down twenty percent from the top, twenty five percent from the mm. top, whatever it is. Uh, and then all the displacement from the rock and the corals and all the other stuff. Um, it's, it's hard to figure it out, but I mean, yeah. if you're gonna dose trace elements and if you're doing ICPs and they're telling you, okay, you can add this much over this many days, um, just be really, just really try to figure out what that water volume is because you can obviously overdose in that case pretty easily. And then mm -hmm. also like, don't be afraid to uh, raise those elements even slower than the uh, allowable amount is is said to be on those those ICPs. Yeah. I mean, just go half as fast, half yeah. as much, half as fast. Just exactly. just to be on the safe side. There's no reason to do it quickly. I yeah. mean, if it There's drifted no down, it drifted down, it drifted down a lot slower than you're gonna bring it up. So like, think about it from that perspective. And I find most people want to fix it instantly, right? It's, it's like hard for people, you know, you myself, you know, I want to fix it right away. Sometimes it's hard to fix it over a week rather than do it yeah. over one or two days. So slow and steady is, you know, wins the race like the turtle in the reef tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, here's an area we can kind of, are we good with dosing? I think we're good. With I think so. Dosing, unless there's anything else you want to say. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about power outages for a mm, second. It's a good Probably go, go on, on on this for a while. Easy. So, I mean, the first thing is, like, have a plan. If you have zero plan, you're probably going to be in bad shape if you have a power outage. And depending on where you live and what the probability is of having a power outage, I mean, that's a factor, too. Um, like, the city that I live in, I don't think in my... I, I lived here my whole life. Uh, I don't think I've seen a power outage more than four to six hours. Mm -hmm. So you know, pretty short, but if you live in a, you know, a, you know, more, more out in the boonies or something like that, you definitely need to have a plan. So, yep. so what's your plan? So ironically, ironic story. I rarely ever have power outages. I bought that little like backup yeah. power station thing at Costco when I saw it. And I was like, Oh, I've always wanted one. And I was like, Oh, it has lithium iron phosphate batteries. Sweet. Those are the batteries I like. So then I bought it two days later. I had a power outage. And then like three or four days, I had another one. I really have ever had power outages. I had two within a week of buying this thing. So it was like very serendipitous how that worked out. Whoa. Yeah. And so I used it. So I just plugged in yeah. the Nero 7 and just let her run and everything was happy. Now this is on my office tank. My big tank, I went slightly hardcore and ran a wire to some batteries that I have outside that's hooked up to solar for all my landscape lighting. Now it also powers my MP60s for backup. So those are pretty solid now. I got to figure out something nice. for the other tank, but the main yeah. tank's pretty good. Um, I did. Yeah. So you're saying you have uh, a battery that will power the MP60s and during the day there's enough solar coming in to basically keep it, keep it charged oh, yeah. and running. Yeah. So that, that's pretty solid yeah. on yeah. one tank. The other tank, I'm still yeah. gotta, gotta work on something for it, but yeah, but I mean, okay. So in terms of priority, like we're going to say, like, I think a hundred percent agree that flow is the first thing that you need to make 100, sure it's running. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, like no question about that. And something that people need to keep in mind um, is that most of our flow pumps and now return pumps are DC. And, um, you know, you could go and buy like a like a power backup. But yeah. um, what you really want is you want to like a battery backup has DC that goes directly to those to those pumps. And some models are better at taking a battery input than others. But um, yeah. one thing that actually I think that would be a really good product to develop, um, and I kind of relate this to my kind of music background is, so I have guitar pedals from all different companies and brands, but they're all nine volts and they're around 100 milliamps or whatever, yeah. something like that. Um, so I think it'd be a really cool product to make a power bank for our reef tanks where anything that's 24 volt can get mm -hmm. powered by the same block of power supplies. So say you could power like, cause like how many more like adapters and transformers and things you need? Think yeah. about if you just had this like, or this this unit that uh, that could power say like 20 pumps or, or 10, 10 different pumps and devices that were 24 yeah. volts. Uh, and maybe there'd be dip switches that would change the, um, the amperage or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you could use a battery backup for that. And yeah. if it's 24 volts, I mean, one of the inefficiencies when you go from AC to DC is you lose you lose a huge amount of efficiency. So if you can mm -hmm. keep everything DC, then 
um, then you're in good shape for sure. So agreed. Uh, somebody work on that product because I would totally buy it. Like you know, if I could well, like just have like one big unit that powered an entire system's worth of pumps, then I would be like. This so is the way to go. Okay, so here's the two <laughs> questions because I've actually been debating doing a very similar thing for my office tank. Um, so, I mean, that being said, 24 volts is a good idea. You can easily just use a 24 volt battery and just use a charger. You can basically charge it as you draw from it at the same time and your power goes out and you still got power. Or you can use like a UPS style inverter that will pass through power and then it will charge it you know that way so there is a few different ways you can do it i have debated this um lots of people use pumps like a nero which is 24 yeah. volts so if you natively powered it from it it's already built in backup you know same flood of gyres or 24 volts um i primarily use the vortex which have a backup battery port that can run up 12 volts which is sweet so that's usually my go-to but yeah. no that is definitely a good way to go yeah um hydro yeah and i mean one of the things that's a little yeah. bit um, kind of depressing to me about it is like it's kind of just so those these brands can sell you their power supply because let's face it they're marked way the hell up too you know yeah. like these power supplies that you can buy the equivalent of a lot of these power supplies on amazon for like 20 bucks and then you want to go buy it from um i'm not going to name any companies but you want to buy it from the 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 company that sold it to you originally and it might be like 60 to 80 bucks for that power supply so yeah you know like I don't know. I think it's uh, it's just plain rude. But uh, how rude? <laughs> yeah. You know, what can you do? So there is um, I have done a lot of DIY. Uh, so your other, I I have done a sorry your videos a little bit. You go. Delayed. Sorry, we got a bit of a delay here. So yeah, it's messing yeah. with me a bit. Uh, I have done a bunch of videos on DIY battery backups in the past, and I have been debating making a new one for the tank, and I have been yeah. eyeing up this like twelve volt like hundred amp hour battery for it, which would last like days, which would be amazing for flow. So that may happen in the day, but it's a couple hundred bucks for that battery, but it'd be yeah. pretty sweet for backup. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to, I guess, temperature being the next uh, issue that you're going to have if you're, I mean, this is going to be dependent on where you live and, and how much your temperature of your tank will change uh, if the power goes out. But um, at that point, you're probably going to be needing to get into generator power. Mm -hmm. um, and you obviously there's a lot of things that go along with having a gas generator um, because you have to maintain it. Um, you have to run it, you know, multiple times a year to make sure that it's it's happy and running. So, um, have you ever run gas generators for backups? Or I bought one this year or last year. I don't know. Yeah, I bought one. It's still I haven't even set it up yet. Like it hasn't had the oil input in it. It's like took it out of the box and put it in my shed, and that's it. Um, so I have one in case it happens, yeah. but I haven't actually used yeah, it. Yeah, that's yet. good enough. It's on standby. Yeah. Well, you're probably almost better um, not using it until you have to because it's probably going to work well for started. But if you run it once and then if you don't maintain it, you, you know, there's a possibility that it won't fire up super well. So uh, but that gets me on to another. Uh, this is kind of uh, more of a future thing. Uh, but some car companies that are making electric hmm. vehicles are uh, allowing, I guess it's an add on where you can actually use the EV to get power for your home. Uh, so I think the Ford vehicles are doing that. Um, I actually had uh, some solar guys come by recently, and they were sort of mm. talking to me about like, you know, what I can do for for backups. And I have an EV; it's a Nissan Leaf, but uh, it doesn't power back. Yep. So he said, "Well, what you could do is you could sell your car in the next couple of years, and then get one of these newer <laughs> ones that that can power your your tank." And my, I mean, you know, I'm frag garage, right? My garage is right in front of my car, so mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's Makes probably sense. what I'm going to do because if I have this giant, you know, say 60 kilowatt battery sitting there, I might as well use it if I have a power outage. Your tanks right, would so. be set for days. Just throwing it out there, since you're in I Canada. Think so. Since you're in Canada, there's a five thousand dollar like grant rebate right now for solar, so you should take advantage of it. Just throwing it out there. I did. It's good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a good way to go for sure. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say about power outages and having a plan? Um, if uh, yeah. I mean, I will actually one more thing I will add is. Yeah. Um, light is going to not be a big factor until you get like a couple days in. But mm -hmm. if you happen to be out for a couple days and you don't have light, your corals are not going to grow and they're not going to consume alkalinity at the same rate. So just be careful that your alkalinity isn't shooting up as the corals aren't yeah. growing. If you get in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hands down, flow is by far the most important thing 
Um, ideally, you know, as long as you're not, you know, living in the Arctic or somewhere where it gets super cold, super fast, usually your, your Roomba temperature is reasonable and it'll keep your tank semi reasonable. Yeah. But flow hundred percent, the most important, your power heads will take the least amount of power and provide the most value on a battery backup. So power head flow, hands down the most important thing on your tank in a power outage, no flow, no life, you know, things going out of oxygen, things are going to go downhill badly. It can live without the heaters for a bit. It can live yeah. without the lighting for a couple of days, you know, even your dosing again without the growth of the light, it's going to not be as demanding. So 100%, if you only run one thing, you need flow during an extended power outage. That's my rant. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Okay. I think that one's yep. checked off. All right. Yep. So next, uh, let's talk about a little bit more to do with the biology. So like I, I kind of wanted to talk about the dangers of, um, in tank treatments, uh, and how to kind of be careful. Like if you have a, something you have to do that is not say like something you can take a coral out to do specifically, um, uh, so fluconazole is one we can talk about. Um, yeah. So for bryopsis algae and certain kinds of hair algae, fluconazole mm -hmm. is extremely effective. And I think extremely safe for our tanks. I have no qualms with using it. The yeah. problem is if you use it on a system that has a lot of algae in it, you're going to have a huge nutrient spike and that can crash your tank. So hmm. if you're going to do fluconazole for, say, bryopsis, I'm going to say move as much as you possibly can before you do a treatment, like absolutely as much as you can and like as much manual removal. And then when you do hit it with the fluconazole, it's not going to be like this massive difference, right? Like that's I, a fair I've point. seen tanks crash from this before. So I yeah. would never think it would crash a tank, but I hundred percent agree. I always remove as much as possible. Like whether it's, you know, Harold Bryopsis, you know, even cyano, like suck it all out first before you treat. But that is a great consideration, right? Yeah. Like, very considered nutrients in the big swing. Yeah. Do uh, another one I will talk about is a uh, flatworm exit. So mm -hmm. if you're treating a system for uh, red planaria flatworms, um, the instructions mm -hmm. are actually really good at warning you for, for how to be careful with the product. But, um, yeah, a friend of mine had a, like a semi crash from it recently. So, um, you know, I thought I would mention this, um, yep. and I'll say his name and totally call him out on it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so who's it? But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here's the thing: is uh, when red planaria flatworms die, they are extremely toxic to your the other biology in your tank. So yep. um, what you need to do is you need to like remove as many as possible before you do the treat. Men. and also mm -hmm. they start kind of falling off the rock and stuff as soon as you do the treatment so yep. um, my recommendation is take like a like quarter inch hose or like some fine hose so you're not sucking a whole bunch of water at a time but just yep. start siphoning them as you see them kind of come off um, and then also have like don't just be ready with like i don't know like 10 or 20 percent water change have a 50 percent water change ready in case you need it and carbon and obviously carbon once uh, the once the treatment has run its course, yep. yeah. So, hundred percent exact. That's a product that works. Carbon, flower. <laughs> no, uh, flower makes it. It definitely yep. works. Mm. <laughs> Carbon does too. <laughs> sure. Totally does. Yeah. I I exact same method I did in the past. I sat there with my little quarter inch hose and I treated just a sump of you know three or four tanks ago. I remember I had the little red ones, little rusty colored ones are over the sump. They're just taken over. Didn't see a single one of the tank. Sump was just littered. Yeah. So again, shut off the return pump, treated the sump, yeah. and sat there with my little holes sucking mm -hmm. up all the ones they fall off. Because again, they're toxic. I don't even know if I did a water change or not, but I definitely ran some heavy carbon after to make sure I removed any of those toxins. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no. So, yeah, beware of the flatworm exit. It is an effective product, but um, okay. I, I, it's hard to estimate how many of those little buggers you can have in the tank. You need to be careful. It's um, true. So it could be worse than you think. Interesting one for you. Do you use any of the bacterial treatments for euphilia? And do you have any concern of it killing off the good stuff for your tank? Yeah, I thought we would get to this hot topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have a few products. I have Cipro, I have uh, Oxalinic Acid, and mm -hmm. I have Chemiclean. 
Yep. Um, I have treated individual corals with Chemiclean, Cipro, actually all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had good results treating them on their own. Um, I think using it in the entire tank, um, you know, this is a very polarized area because yep. some people... Some people think it's like, you know, absolutely don't treat the whole tank. You're going to get by, you know, like antibiotic resistance. Uh, it's it's going to build up. I don't know. I'm, I like sometimes I wonder if like. If maybe we're taking ourselves a little too seriously as reef aquarium hobbyists, <laughs> but but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be messing around with that stuff too much. Um, yeah, so, I think more studies are being done, and um, I would say that oxalic acid is probably a safer uh, antibiotic to use than Cipro because it's not used in human populations, um, and it's a slightly less broad spectrum, but similar spectrum. That's fair, as far as I understand. I have not tried that one yet, but I have tried Cipro and Amox on a dip, and I have been, you know, debated the in tank treatment of it, and from mm -hmm. what I've researched. It does break down, you know, within sunshine and likely under UVs. And I think it would break down in our tanks relatively quickly under our aquarium lighting. So I don't mm -hmm. think that's as big an yeah. issue. And even with water changes, like, again, I think it would break down a lot. And I think, you know, if someone takes it prescribed, I mean, you're going to pee out more in the toilet than you would probably release via a water change in your tank. But I do question, yeah. are you killing a substantial amount or negligible amount of the good bacteria in your tank if you're doing the intact treatment and what are the long-term repercussions of that like i do know lots of coral vendors that will run it in their systems as a preventative so that's why i'm always kind of curious on this like because we don't it's yeah. still fairly new so i don't think we know a ton like we know it works but is there any you know percussions on like the good bacteria for instance and you know the, the healthy bio yeah i tank? mean i think I think that the good bacteria for the most part is, is pretty good at like, at, you know, proliferating in our tanks. It's pretty mm -hmm. good at, at replicating and, and feeling, being available. I mean, you can add bacteria to your tank if you think you want to, you know, diversify the strains or whatever. But, um, I mean, I've run chemically on my tanks, uh, without having cyano to mm -hmm. kind of give my tanks a little bit of a, uh, uh, I'd say a slight reset in bacteria and my corals have looked better afterwards for yeah. sure. hundred percent look better afterwards. Um, yeah. so, and, uh, if anybody doesn't know, chemically is, uh, I guess the primary antibiotic and it is erythromycin. Hmm. Uh, um, and, and apparently it's also, uh, not legal to use chemically in Europe. They don't have chemically there. Interesting. It's a, more of a controlled, <laughs> controlled thing there. So, um, yeah, but, uh, I, I just think if anybody's thinking about doing uh, hitting the whole tank with a bac antibacterial treatment to do a lot of reading and research and uh, listen to people that really know what they're talking about yeah. when it comes to the subject. Um, and I think Julian Sprung is doing a study. I think Chris Meckley is involved in this, too, that has to do with um, oxalinic acid and, yeah. um, you know, potentially finding uh, some treatment protocols for that. But uh, like I said, I actually had some I have treated spot treated in say five gallons of water um i've done euphelia i've done torches yeah. uh, where i was losing a couple of polyps on a colony mm -hmm. um, and i put a few colonies in an oxalinic acid bath uh, uh, overnight and uh they i didn't have any more loss on them they look great afterwards so nice. uh, i think there's a lot of potential there yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean if you can get, yeah. get your hands on it yeah i got i gotta find some and try it one day i i know like even with chemi clean like my if after you a chemical clean treatment after that, that like two to three days, like your tank just looks so clean, clean and pristine and vibrant. Like it just looks so good and like pristine. Even the sand's like freaking white. Like it looks good. But, but again, I still always wonder like, is there yeah. any negative, you know, are you killing the good stuff and doing well, any resets? Um, I don't know. But yeah. I mean, another thing I'll say about chemical clean because it, um, it kind of causes this kind of hyper oxygen kind of, thing to happen that's why you get all the micro bubbles is uh the micro bubbles will irritate your coral tissue and potentially if you have a heavily stocked system um you might see a, a rise in alkalinity because your corals are irritated and aren't growing as fast so uh, that's something i've had to monitor if i've ever run chemically is mm -hmm. uh i've had to monitor my alkalinity really closely so i'll change my apex so it tests uh 
I mean, what is it, six times or four times a day is the the lowest Default. you can do for alkalinity. So I'll change it to be eight or 12. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, because yeah. sometimes it's not the product you use. Like the same thing with the fucanazole we talked about. It's not mm -hmm. the product itself. It's the, you know, the what carries on after you, yeah. you use it. So, um, yeah, it, it's true. You 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 can make a test less, but. I don't know. Four, four is the default. I do on one tank. I have four. Yeah. The other, I have twice. But yeah, um, haven't had to clean my tank since treatment. It definitely does work. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I know. So what else we got on the list? Um, power uh, shot uh, I got skimmer safety. This is all pretty boring stuff. Hey, this is probably the most boring stream we've ever done. It's, <laughs> but it's, th but there's it's good nuggets anything. in here though. Yeah. <laughs> good nuggets mixed yeah, for in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so let's, we could talk about skimmer safety. We could talk about overflow safety. We could talk about UV sterilizers. Kate, what's your thoughts? Pick one. Do you use it? Do you think it's valuable? Uh, I do. And I have for about the last year and a half or maybe about a year. Um, I couldn't tell you if I've seen a big difference for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, speaking of the safety side of it, um, so there's a couple different ways you can run it is you can run an isolated pump that runs the UV on its own, or you can attach it to your return. And yeah. that kind of goes back because we talked about return pumps and redundancy. Uh, I run them on my return pumps because mm -hmm. I know those returns are running. Yeah. Um, so the only thing that if you want to dial in the flow rate, you know, you're at the mercy of what you're tank flow is going to be so i just happen to have uvs that um you know they operate at the same rate as the flow that i'm sending through them so strategy <laughs> uh, based on what i'm trying to zap for but um one thing that you can use for uvs if you want to have a little safety protocol on them because the risk is if the if they sit dry um then the bulb can crack and then you have exposure to whatever electronic components are in there mm -hmm. which it can be real bad for the tank um, uh, one thing is, uh, the insulation has to be correct too. And they, they show you a diagram. And the main thing is that the UV has to sit so that if for some reason the pump isn't running, mm -hmm. the water is still surrounding the, the bulb. So if the bulb, say the bulb stays mm -hmm. on and the return's not running, yep. um, that's a problem that will happen with people is they'll go, okay, oh shit, my return wasn't running, but my UV was on and they turn that return pump on and it's all super fucking hot. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this like you know 78 degree water hits it and it cracks yeah so um that's a probably your main risk of uv sterilizer is is uh that bulb running dry and that's fair burning if, out on you if you have an aquarium controller i always add the code on like if pump off then off for example like in the apex so yeah. that it it turns yeah. it off if yeah. your return pump or whatever feed pump is ever off just is that extra safety feature totally and then on top of that, the other thing you have with controllers is uh, flow sensors. So if you have flow sensors, they will tell you if there isn't flow going through that, it'll send you an alert and then you can go and take a look at it and yep. address you, the issue too. Do you use flow sensors? So, um, yeah. Do you use flow sensors on your tank at all? <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny, funny that you ask because I have a flow sensor on one of my UVs and it's never worked. Um, <laughs> and then I also put one on my calcium reactor effluent and i don't know if it's just not enough flow it's like 100 mils a minute which maybe yeah. no 90 mils a minute uh it never worked so i mm. uh, neptune if you want to send me some new ones i'll take them uh but <laughs> so <laughs> yeah they never worked for me so I, i'm not sure why but. you need to well you do need to take them apart and clean them periodically so they might be gummed up with something these were brand time. new brand yeah, new okay. brand new never worked yeah all right then i'm gonna guess on enough flow yeah. so I personally, like, I played with one for a while, but then I kind of quit using it. But, yeah, I don't know. I have one. Maybe I'll put it back on and play with it again. It inspired me a little bit. Like, yeah. even with the UV, it's like, there's certain things where, like, I don't overly care how much flows through it. Like, I'm just like, ah, oh, this looks about right. Which, it would for UV, it's not the best attitude because there's certain ranges for, you know, algae and there's certain for, it's because protozoa, whatever you call it, like fish viruses. Do you run yours at lower or higher flow? Like, are you targeting parasites or are you just general like algaes and more stuff? Like, what do you run yours at? 
Um, I'm pretty sure. So, like, I'm running mine at about, these are, I think, the 54 watt or the 48 watt, and they're running at, like, about 2,000 gallons an hour. That's if okay. they were at zero head. But I think that's more for, um, that's more like a, uh, for, say, algae dinoflagellites, um, you know, things like that. I think that I'm pretty sure from what I remember, uh, fish diseases are a uh, lower flow. Like you yeah. want to, you want to hit them with that light at a slower rate. So, um, yeah. you need more contact yeah. time. But, uh, have, have you yeah, noticed more contact time? Yeah. But, um, yeah. Have you noticed any difference on cleaning the glass with or without UV? Any noticeable impact or difference? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, That's fair. I mostly notice a difference with more algae on the glass if phosphates are a little bit more elevated. I seem to notice more film film on the glass. But That's fair. Um, I, I mean, my tanks have always been pretty crystal clear water. So um, I never really, I didn't notice a big difference in clarity when I added a UV. But um, but yeah, um, I mean, it seems to help some people with dinoflagellites. Mm -hmm. um, Yep. I assume if you have uh, a type of coral pest um, that, you know, freely hatches and is in the water column, um, you probably have a better chance of stopping their replication from having a UV as well, yep. I would think. Yep. Um, speaking of so, dinos, um, that's yeah. a big one too. Um, some species are photosynthetic and they will be free floating at nighttime in the water column. And those are the ones UV affects. Um, there's other varieties that are not photosynthetic mm -hmm. and then UV is useless on them. So it depends on the species that you have. I originally bought my UV yeah. for like trying to reduce cleaning the glass. I can't say if there's been any noticeable difference um, on it, but that was my original yeah. justification for trying UV. I do use ozone, yeah. which I'm a fan of. Yeah, I don't of. know. I just Same have thing. them. I just have them on and I'm just kind of like, do I, I, I mean... Warm and fuzzy running, but it's just it's another point of potential failure too. So, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing, actually, this is just a little side thing is uh, if I ever see my trochus snails breeding, I turn off my UV for a few days because I don't want to give those babies a chance to 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 settle. <laughs> Some bonus <laughs> trochus snails. While. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, actually. for sure. Do you ever yeah, see sn yeah. completely random? But do you ever see sail snails spawning in your tank? Like you're seeing the the little tube out. It looks like they're like smoking or something and. It's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No. I, I have one photo have from like time. a, yeah, I have a photo mm -hmm. like on Instagram from like a year ago and he looks like a wizard. It looks like he's holding a hand up in the air with like a little smoking rod. It looks hilarious. But yeah, good, good, <laughs> good, good times. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, we can talk about skimmer safety. It won't take very long. That's um, a good one. Yeah, because I mean, I think everybody has had a skimmer uh, empty its entire skim it into your <laughs> sump before <laughs> and i on most of the time unless your system is like rocking super high nutrients it's kind of just like a little nutrient spike and your skimmer is just gonna skim it back out again afterwards mm -hmm. anyways which is not a big deal but um what is your opinion on uh skim some skimmers have a built-in uh safety mechanism so some have yep. a little float in the in the top of the cup Mm -hmm. And then some have an optical sensor. And also you can buy third-party optical sensors as well. Uh, what's your opinion on these and their reliability and whatnot? One tank, I have a third-party optical, and the other one I have nothing. So 50-50. The, the, the tank yeah. where I have lids on my sump is the one I put it in. Because if it overflows onto the lids, that's not just good. Um, the, the tank that's with open, like no lids on the sump, that one, I don't have anything on it. Cause I mean, it just flow back into the sump. It's not the end of the world. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's obviously two ways to do it because you can have a level sensor in the sump so mm -hmm. that if the sump level rises too much for the skimmer body, it will turn the skimmer off using a, yeah. you know, aquarium controller. So that's one way to do it. Uh, I mean, and, and in some cases, you'll have the optical sensors actually in the skimmer cup. But um, I think by that point, you know, that's I'd say in the sump is better for that. But um, that's a good yeah, idea. I actually, so. Yeah, it's probably a better way to do it. Come to think of it. You just inspired me. I have one of the little miniature Neptune level sensors that I haven't done anything with. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm going to put it in the skimmer chamber on my sump. Good call. 
inspired me. Yeah, and if, if it project. misfires, um, you know, no big deal, right? Like if it if it if it triggers your skimmer off by accident, it's like whatever, your skimmer's off for until yeah. you notice it was off. <laughs> it's not a big yeah, deal. Um, but yeah, something I'll, I'll say about the um, like uh, the Reef Octopus. I have a Reef Octopus Elite, and I think it's probably one of the best skimmers on the market for the price. Nice. Um, and it has a little float switch in the top mm. of the cup. The only thing that sucks about it is it's a pain in the ass to clean. Um, ah. And, you know, it's also just another, like, cable that's going to something that you have to have wire management for. So, um, that's fair. But same with an optical sensor. So, yeah. That's fair. But uh, but other than that, I mean, it's uh, uh, the, what's the other thing? There's also um, a outlet delay uh, things yeah. for skimmers. So uh, I can't remember which company makes it, but... Uh, basically, so if your power goes out and it comes back on, your sump level is going to be super high when that power comes back on. But the skimmer mm -hmm. doesn't care about that. So yeah. the skimmer is just going to be like, bah! <laughs> so yep. often people will have a skimmer overflow when their power comes back on. So that's something to keep in mind. So what this little outlet thing does is it delays the skimmer turning on by like 10 mm -hmm. minutes or something like that. So it gives it that's time cool. for the sump to get to its normal level. So. That's a, that's not a bad little mechanism. It's for you know not too much money. That that's I think fair. probably is worth looking into. And yeah. if you, if you have an aquarium control like an Apex, just put in that defer five colon zero zero then on, and then it will wait five minutes after it gets power before it turns on. I do that as well on mine for same thing. Mm -hmm. Like just once you're in feed mode and you come out of it, you know it turns it off. It waits five minutes. Plenty of time for your pumps and the water level to stabilize before it gives it power again. Yeah, totally. Beautiful. Uh, okay, that's good for skimmers, I think. Uh, do you want to talk about being away, going out on vacation, and preparing for vacation? Talked about this a little bit earlier. Other than uh, which is, I'm going to just highlight it again. Yeah. Don't change anything before you leave. <laughs> Don't. I I would agree. You can do your maintenance. You can refill your dosing containers, refill your ATO, yeah. clean your skimmer, but don't add anything new. Um, auto auto feeder, prime example. Yeah. Put on your tank a week ahead of time. Make sure it's not dumping in copious amounts of pellets, pellets to your tank. You want to make sure, you know, everything's running smoothly for at least a week before you go away. Um, especially anything new. Like, do not add it a day or before, yeah. two before you leave. Very important. Totally, totally agree on that. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing is uh, Wi-Fi cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so I use these Wi-Fi cams that I got on Amazon, and they're like yep. 40 bucks. And, I mean, like, all I really need to see when I'm away is that like the water is clear, the yeah. pumps are running, uh, you know, like just I just want some big visual cues. And, I, I, you know, I can be in like Indo Indonesia or whatever and be like, yeah, OK, fish are swimming. Tanks not cloudy, like mm -hmm. good enough, like it's, it's running. So that that doesn't take much. And it's just like, you know, just like a couple checks a day. You don't have to be obsessed with it. But, yep. um, you know, for a forty dollar camera to get an angle or two of your your tank. Um, I would say super worthwhile. So wise. Um, um, pro tip from experience: those. Do not screw with your aquarium controller, controller from an airplane with questionable signal. Just leave it there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Not, not okay. a good plan. Yeah, don't. F okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I afflict on things that wanna, should not have been left uh, on. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I see. Yep. Uh, uh, another I, thing I would say is, I mean, this depends on your community around you, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, don't be afraid to ask for help because, like, if you have other hobbyist friends in your area that, you know, can feed your fish or just do a, like, yeah. quick visual inspection or whatever, like, you know, what goes around comes around. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to help them when they're away too. So just, like, get a good uh, community of people around you. Um, I know I do, and I mean, just want to say yeah. thank you to these people right now mm -hmm. because uh, whenever I go away, I have like, you know, I cycle through about five or six people that I know will will help me out. So um, super, super nice to have those people around. Yep. And bonus points if they're actually a reefer and they could spot something that's off in your tank versus just a buddy that <laughs> knows nothing about reef tanks. Okay, um, now. Yeah, Adam, yeah, for sure. I I need to give you a quick shout out here, buddy, because you recently started a podcast, oh, yeah. and it's I true. have sneakishly listened to the first few episodes before you release it, and I'm really digging it. I'm excited for it to listen to more. Um, so if you enjoy this type of stuff, you're definitely gonna like Adam's podcast. Adam, what's your podcast called? Yeah, yeah, thanks, man. Uh, well, it's called Beyond the Reef, and um. Yeah, I've been wanting to do it for a while because like I sometimes I just have conversations with other people in the hobby and I 
I just think it, you know, it's it honestly it gives me an excuse to reach out to people uh, that I've wanted to talk to and have these conversations and then make them available for people. So it's called Beyond the Reef. Uh, yeah, you can check it on my site, fraggarage.ca, and then there's a link to it there. And uh, where, where yeah, you they're on it? YouTube right now. I am eventually going to do video. Uh, well, it's it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major podcast apps, and then also the YouTube channel. Um, which if you just go to Frag Garage on YouTube, you can find it there. Yeah, there's a link there. Or, nice. or click on that. You got um, options. But yeah, so for first step, yeah, first episode was Leonardo's Reef, who is based out of uh, uh, Amsterdam kind of area, and he was awesome to talk to. Uh, uh, Pirates Reef, Ray, also super awesome. Uh, like him and I have been kind of Instagram buddies for a while, but we never really yeah. had a full on combo. So it was, and his corals look super awesome. So, Beautiful. so that was really cool. Uh, and then unorthodox reef, Jay, Jay Brown, <laughs> um, probably one of the nicer display, probably one of the nicer displays in, in Canada. That tank is nice. awesome. Um, so, uh, and then I just did one with farmer Ty, which is going to come out on Friday. So, nice. so. Uh, hopefully people. Check it out. If yeah, yeah, there we go. My camera will focus. <laughs> that's that, that's the logo you're looking for. So yeah, definitely check it out. Yes. Really good conversations. I mean, I love doing this. Basically, the same sort of dealio, but you're doing it with other, you know, people growing corals and great conversations. So it's fun. So yeah, subscribe. Check yeah. them out. Yeah, it's very coral based. Lots I'm to do with coral. That's for sure. I'm gonna <laughs> listen to episode three tonight. I'm excited for it. Could be good. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and uh, I think I was saying uh, we are going to do video eventually where there's going to be the discourse of the two people talking. But right now, the like YouTube this. side is just uh, <laughs> clips of, yeah, basically clips of people's tanks. I just don't want to do, I don't want to do the same thing you're doing. It's, make it my own thing. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Um, so, yeah. No, awesome. No, I definitely enjoy it. So I wanted to make sure you guys check it out as well because you will guarantee to enjoy it because um, Adam is a fountain of information. And you ask good questions, actually. So it's good. It's a good learning experience. That's one yeah, thing about this good. hobby. Good to hear. Thank you. Yeah. One thing about this hobby, you will never know it all. You will never be an expert. We are all always learning. And I don't know. It's one of those things where I just I love consuming the information. And I feel like that's probably goes for a lot of us hardcore reefers. The addiction's yeah, real. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if you are going to listen to someone and really, really be like, this person knows what they're talking about, like, listen to people that are, like, actually have that science biology background, you know, like, people yeah. that are, you know, in the front lines of this stuff. Like, most of the stuff that I talk about is, is you know, stuff that I've learned from other people. I've applied mm -hmm. myself, but I try to use the language where I say, this is what I've heard or this is what I believe, yeah. uh, as opposed to being, like, this is what it is, <laughs> you know, no, so the language exactly. is really important. So, and I mean, yeah. there um, is many okay. ways well, to accomplish the same thing. Oh. Like seriously, like that's one, ah, sorry, I just got so, yeah, so. Totally. one thing that I love is like, you can have 10 different opinions. You could all be right because there's a lot of ways to accomplish the same thing. And I think that's one of the cool things about all these conversations. Ryan, you guys are awesome. Thank you for the super chat. $2 super chat, buddy. Appreciate it. Mm. Thanks. I know. Uh, okay, I had I had another uh, little category here we Do can tell. get into, Would which get? is a calc waster. Uh, so calc, um, I mean, as you know, it has uh, a lot of benefit to reef aquariums, especially yep. uh, coral. <laughs> um, but there are some risks involved, um, depending on what method you're using. So mm -hmm. uh, I think you and I are both using the same method, which is like a low saturation. Uh, low saturation dissolved um kind of like the chris meckley method i guess you would say uh in a in a reservoir where you know if that entire reservoir was to for some reason have a failure point um you know you have to think about the repercussions of that and um so the other options are calc slurry or a calc stir so mm -hmm. um i guess we could talk about each each one i use a stirrer because I'm too lazy to mix up a batch every week. So I'm a big fan of going the stirrer route. What about yourself? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just doing the lower saturation. So 6.5 grams a gallon. Yep. And I just use a little feed pump. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a constant dose pump. Uh, it only runs at night. Yep. Uh, but as a safety, I do have a rule in my apex, which will turn that outlet off if the pH is above 
I don't know, like 8.7 or something like that. Like if it, yeah. for some reason the pH was super spiked, it would be like, oh, I probably shouldn't keep dosing this because the pH That's should fair. not be 8.7. So, um, yeah. I got but, uh, a similar thing. Yeah, so you're using a calc stir now. So yeah. that's obviously more saturated than than what I'm doing. So tell me about like how that's set up. So I basically I dose roughly what I evaporate. So on my water box, I believe it's around 5,500 to 6,000 mils a night. That's approximately what I evaporate. And I do only dose it at nighttime now because I'm trying to compensate my pH dips. So I get pretty solid pH in the day. So a lot of my, even with my, alkalinity solution dosing on top of my calcium. So calcium reactor is 24-7. Uh, my calc wasser is, I believe it doses from like midnight to noon. And then my alkalinity dosing, my sodium, doses from, I think it's like 8 or 10 p.m. to noon, something like that. But basically, so a lot of my heavy-duty yeah. pH-boosting supplements are through the night to kind of counteract the dip that I would normally get. So that's the way I've been working yeah. for quite a while. That's interesting though, because it means if you're dosing your, um, are you using sodium, are you using soda ash or sodium bicarb, or is it a combo? Hydroxides. Um, I'm using the nasty stuff on my tank. Um, oh, hydroxides. Yeah. Oh, you're crazy, man. It's, I know. It's like super, yeah, super elevating. So, yeah. but you probably that as a result, you probably have a bit of an alkalinity spike at night. I would uh, imagine. Not that much, actually. There, there's a, yeah, not that no? much to be honest. I should put the apex on hourly doses through the night and see what it yeah. does. But, but I, yeah. but keep in mind, this is supplemental to my calcium reactor at like 45, 50 mils a minute running 24 seven. So that's doing the, the majority of it. And these are just like mm -hmm. add ons of hundred mils of elk and, you know, the six and a half liters of calc on top of it. Yeah. But it works well. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I just say, I would say a safety thing for calc in general and similar to the auto top off thing we talked about is think about the reservoir that is feeding the tank. And if the worst case scenario occurred where that entire reservoir ended up in your tank in a short amount of time, um, mm -hmm. you know, what would the repercussions be of that? Yep. So, um, you know, you probably shouldn't be using a 60 gallon calc reservoir even if you have the space to do it on a you know 30 gallon tank or something like that mm -hmm. even though it might be great that it lasts a month um yeah you know but um i have an appropriate sized reservoir it, it's it might be a little more work like i have to refill mine once a week um but i also think that filling it once a week uh helps the ph of the calc stay fresher it, and it does more elevated so because if there's too much air exposure yeah. it will lose saturation over time it'd be less potent so that is yeah. a very good point. You know, weekly is okay. I don't think I'd want to do every day or every couple of days, but weekly is not bad. This is from yeah. the la lazy yeah, sure. first time. Uh, <laughs> another thing I will say about calc is uh, the quality matters to a degree. I mean, as long as you're using, um, you know, a commercial brand that, um, you know, you're probably good. Uh, I've been just started using the Captivate calc and uh, I can definitely say I saw a big difference in yeah. uh, the 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 how easily it dissolved and I even had like more pH benefit probably I wouldn't say like 0 0.05 but I would say like 0 0.03 0 0.04 um, yeah. like higher than um, was was what my low was so um, mm -hmm. yeah but uh, one of the risks with calc if you're just using like a food grade um, is that uh, a lot of the areas that these are mixed you might get high levels of aluminum or lithium or things like that so uh, or all, who knows all kinds of other pure impurities could be in there. So, um, calc's cheap enough that you might as well spend the money on the better stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I agree. I'm a big advocate for that. So, especially if you're putting a lot into the tank. So, mm -hmm. this is, um... uh, yeah. My only other thing for this was, um, yeah, go ahead. Nope. Um, which, where do you buy captivate? Do you order it from the U S or do you find it in Canada? Um, yeah, actually, I haven't really made an official announcement, but I've been kind of back and forth with Chris Wood from Captivate on uh, bringing his products into Canada. And uh, we've done some test shipping and it's gone well. So I'm uh, pretty soon I'm going to be adding it to my site. So I will be the first uh, seller Canadian of Captivate source? in Canada. So, so now uh, I know who to bug. Yeah, Excellent. and uh, the calc will be, <laughs> yeah, the calc will be one of the items I definitely try to keep in stock. Um, oh, that's and then awesome. Some of the elements that. Yeah. So, no, but, but yeah, that's coming. 
Um, Beautiful. I like but it. Yeah. I haven't used the BRS. I saw this was in one of the comments. I haven't used the BRS, but I've heard it's mm. really good as well. So um, yeah. I think that it's like, uh, yeah, there's the, yeah, the, the high end sort of pharmaceutical grade is probably all kind of coming from the same place you would assume. Yeah. So, so, all right. Um, you want my quick Coke spiel? So I, yeah, yeah. I have used a bunch of different, I've used everything from industrial calc. I've used BRS pharma. I've used Brightwell, two little fishies. I haven't tried Cativate yet. Um, the, biggest things is if you are doing general calc dosing um not the slurry but just the clear liquid the the better stuff generally will have a higher ph um the cheaper stuff usually you won't get as much of a boost out of it because again the more exposure to oxygen and more impurities you know if it's not handled as well in packaging there it's gonna not give you quite as good of a ph kick if you are doing something like the slurry where you're putting some of that powder into your tank, it matters a lot more because calc is still fairly dirty stuff. And the cheaper stuff is going to have more impurities. The better stuff is going to have less impurities. And especially for people that never do a water change, eventually those impurities are going to add up in your tank and cause trouble. If you do water changes that may never catch kick you in the butt, but if you're a person that rarely does water changes, those impurities eventually are going to build up to, you know, some critical mass level and bite you one day. So that's kind of my spiel on like cheap versus expensive kelp. Cause I've yeah. been all over the spectrum on stuff I've tried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, um, generally from what I've heard, those impurities, like I said, are going to be aluminum and some of those, um, what are they, like the, yeah, certain metals or halogens or whatever, yeah. but, uh, yeah, things to know. keep in mind for yeah. sure. Cool. Um, good to know yeah. you're doing. I, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, we pretty much got through all my notes on the, the subject. Um, pretty solid one today. Anything else here? If you guys have any yeah, overflow safety. questions, let us know. Overflow. Have you yeah. ever had a tank overflow? No, like, I haven't. I mean, I've always had redundancy on it. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's more of a thing of the past where tanks, um, you know, with the people didn't quite things. have, you know, if you're using a siphon overflow or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, most tanks have the redundancy, but just, you know, keep it clean. Keep an eye on it. Um, if you if you can do the what is it? The bean animal, which is three tubes instead of two. If you're building a custom tank, yeah. you might as well do it. You know, Agreed. because the first two hoses or the first two returns will take the variance and then the last one's just there as backup so yeah um yeah but i think that's a yeah it's pretty much all my notes uh so hopefully this prevents a disaster or two you know <laughs> yep. making hopefully we save somebody's reef tank watching this or inspired you to do something better to keep your tank you know turn that three-year tank into the 10-year tank and go or longer hopefully you know go inevitable if it was some of these fish can live you know 20 30 years so if you're keeping a tank that long that's pretty awesome um uh, ryan yeah doghouse reefer nick thank you guys for super chats much appreciated shelly thank you as well yeah. uh make sure you check out the beyond the reef podcast because adam's awesome and he has a great show and i'm excited to listen to the next one yeah if you enjoyed this hit the like button um make the youtube gods happy uh can you recommend a good calquasser personally um two little fishies captivate or the brs farmer are like the main ones that i tend to gravitate not captivate i haven't used it but i've heard a lot of good things but those are the couple ones that i would say are yeah, probably like good. the the better ones uh when are we gonna get frag rag curls in the usa i don't know that's an adam question <laughs> dun 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 uh, it's just not possible right now without yeah. the sighties yeah i wish i could but uh yeah <laughs> I wish there was a way, like if it's growing in captivity, you think it'd be fair game, but I don't know how you'd prove it, but it'd be cool if there was eventually one day an easy way to deal with the, the captive yeah. bread stuff. Be good. Good stuff. All right, guys. Hopefully yeah. you enjoyed it. Yeah. Check out all that good stuff. Adam, 